Mr. Hidarian. What a change it seems that the bilateral relations between China and the Philippines compared to, let's just say, the Aquino administration. Sea change, shall we say. Yeah. Yeah, without a question, it's a radical change, especially to have a uh, president of the Philippines going aboard Chinese warships. Uh, and then, of course, on the warship saying that he's not very sure if he can meet the American president after Donald Trump went the extra mile to invite Southeast Asian leaders, including Duterte. So I think that was very symbolic. And remember, the warship visit by China was just a few days after the ASEAN summit, whereby the Philippines, especially Duterte, made it very sure that there will be no, uh, uh, no statement that will be criticizing China very strongly. In fact, countries like Vietnam mm -hmm. wanted the issue of reclamation and militarization of the disputes to be in the statement, but Duterte blocked any discussion of that. So Duterte very much looks forward to his upcoming visit to China for the One Road, One Belt Summit and his meeting with Xi Jinping. So he really doesn't want to rock the boat. So in that sense, the relationships have very much improved. But remember, on the right. other hand, a few weeks ago, there were tensions when Duterte said he's going to plant a flag in the disputed uh, uh, land features in Nansha or in Spratlys. And he actually deployed his defense minister and army chief also to inspect the area. And he has actually also allocated 1.6 billion pesos to build up the Philippine facilities okay. there. So it's, it's kind of a mixture, but definitely a sea change from last year. <laughs> Mr. Hidari, I think you have a lot of thoughts in your mind, a lot of information. So we're going to break down some of those information you just mentioned and uh, talk about them one by one, I guess. Uh, Senior Captain Zhang here in Beijing. Wow, three ships, right? I mean, one is a destroyer, the other a supply ship, and also a frigate trip, a ship. Um, President Duterte even talked about the joint military exercises with China. From the military perspective, what do you make of this change? Yes, uh, we can see that the, the foreign policy taken by the Philippines uh, government under Mr. Duterte has changed a lot, from, especially from his predecessor, Mr. Aquino III, uh, which had made provocations against China during his term. Mm -hmm. Now I think uh, the Philippines government is taking a normal, uh, independent uh, foreign policy, toward, both toward China and also the United States. I think this is conducive to peace and stability in this region. All right. Mr. Lim, some say President Duterte has been quite a smart yes. guy particularly uh, Philippine, even though geographically ra rather small, and yet be able to work with two great powers. One is the United States, the other, of course, is China, particularly during this term of the presidency. What do you make of that balance President Duterte, quote unquote, seem to keep at this point? I think uh, Mr. Duterte is uh, what is known as a realist. So he manages to assess uh, the situation and based on the national interests uh, of the uh, Philippines, uh, he has decided to outreach uh, to uh, uh, China and uh, in this uh, occasion, the Chinese Navy. And there are two keywords that stands out uh, from this visit. The first keyword is goodwill. So uh, he's trying to show uh, outreach uh, to uh, China uh, by a show of goodwill, visiting the vessels, and even talking about the possibilities uh, of exercises in Mindanao or Sulu Sea. Mm -hmm. And the other key word that he mentioned is confidence building measure. And so confidence building is always good uh, for the region because it's a no detriment uh, measure and it helps uh, different countries, different stakeholders in the region know each other better. Mm. But what about from the Chinese side, the senior Captain Zhang? We saw earlier some press photos of President Duterte smiling big uh, among the Chinese uh, uh, naval officers on board. Obviously, that's quite a change from the official expression. But what about the mixed messages uh, Mr. Hidarian from the Philippines also mentioned? On the one hand, possibly joint military exercises, but on the other hand, Filipinos president did on several occasions, as well as the government, mention about their responsibilities and rights in the South China Sea. Well, I think uh, Mr. Duterte's uh, visit to the Chinese uh, destroyer uh, uh, shows that he is trying to uh, mend the relationship and improve the relationship with China. And uh, this is good for the, the two uh, countries. And also, I think the uh, joint military exercise between the two navies uh, of the Philippines and China 
uh, are feasible because we know that Ch the Chinese Imperial Navy has conducted uh, uh, such kind of uh, exercises with other countries also in, in this region. Mm -hmm. And also the Philippines has been conducting joint military exercises with other countries. So it is normal for the Philippines to conduct such kind of military exercises with China. Of course, there is a territorial dispute between China and the Philippines, but I think the, both sides now have agreed that we should set aside the disputes and seek for joint development. And we can see the economic and trade relationship between the two sides mm. now is improving very much, very rapid. And this is in the interest, fundamental interest of uh, all the, uh, both countries. Has Mr. Hidarian the relationship becoming more matured than it used to be? Hearing what Senior Captain Zhang just said, well, you definitely need the deepening of the bilateral relationship to, first of all, avoid the conflict in the South China Sea as the area becomes more congested. Uh, the other thing is that there's huge potential for uh, an expanded economic relationship between the Philippines, a rising emerging market, and China, which is now supporting massive infrastructure projects, the One Road, One Belt, and Maritime Circuit Road Initiative. So there could be a lot that could be done on the economic front and the diplomatic front. Like and what? The other things like that, what? Of like what? Mr. Hidarian, like what? A lot to be done. What are those things, concrete things, that you think on the near horizon? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, Duterte is very much looking forward to Chinese investment in railway projects in the mm. Philippines, including in his home island of Mindanao. And that could also provide in, uh, you know, opportunities for Chinese state-owned enterprises to have overseas businesses. Uh, the other thing is that you have to restore the diplomatic relationship so that you have the proper communication channels, hotline between your militaries, between your Coast Guard, and of course, as we move towards joint exercises and more interaction between uh, the Philippine Armed Forces and the Chinese Armed Forces, the possibility for unwanted escalation or conflict in the high seas is also dramatically reduced. And as our uh, Singaporean friend said, confidence building measure is always a good thing for everyone. So these are the concrete things that everyone is looking forward. Mm -hmm. And then not to mention Duterte actually scaled back two major military exercises with the U.S., the Karat and Fiblex, which are pointing out at China, and he prevented the Americans under the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement to build also advanced bases in Bautista Air Base in Palawan, which is looking at uh, the Spratly chain of islands. So he has also done certain concrete things to raise confidence in China that he's not an American puppet, that he wants an independent foreign policy. But mm -hmm. of course, there have been some opposition and pushback even within his government, especially the military in the Philippines, which is very cozy with U.S., and still quite critical of China. Right. Mr. Lin Chen Wai, uh, I know you're from Singapore, but Singapore usually wanted to play a role between the East and the West. And therefore, I want to ask you from your perspective, what do you think is the bottom line for the United States, for example, to have its relationship with the Philippines vis-a-vis -vis China? And what is the bottom line from Singapore perspective uh, for China? Uh, for its relationship with the Philippines vis-a-vis -vis the United States. It seems to be a very interesting chessboard that we're looking at. Mr. Lim. I think uh, from the uh, recent events that have taken place, uh, President uh, Duterte is uh, trying to have a balanced uh, di diplomacy. So besides uh, outreaching uh, to China, and also besides uh, having uh, the uh, traditional uh, friendship with the uh, U.S., uh, President Duterte is also reaching out to uh, Russia. And he's also uh, has uh, in recent times mentioned about joint exercises with Russia. And in all these cases, uh, the uh, outreach for cooperation seems to hint or to uh, look at a, a well-balanced uh, diplomacy uh, from the Philippines' uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. From the ASEAN perspective, I think uh, the region wants peace uh, for economic development. And as uh, uh, Professor Hedarian has mentioned, there's a lot of economic potential that can be mastered if uh, there is peaceful uh, cooperation between all stakeholders uh, in uh, the uh, region. And we can see that not just uh, the Philippines, but uh, China is also contributing through the One Belt, One Road, as well as the AIB in right. projects. Uh, like uh, the uh, medium speed railway in Indonesia and also uh, in uh, other parts of uh, East A uh, East Southeast Asia. So I think all these, is to, all these uh, developments will lay a foundation for peaceful development 
from which economic cooperation can take place. This is particularly crucial because of potential. As you know, uh, December 2015, ASEAN Economic Community was formed. Right. And so uh, before the common market or the uh, community is built, there can be uh, much more uh, cooperation uh, for greater integration. Mm. And of course, the Philippines is the rotating presidency for ASEAN this year. Having said that, Senior Captain Zhang made me wonder how sustainable I wonder if from the Chinese side also has the same question. Is this policy likely to keeping a balance for the Philippines with some of the major powers? Will that be sustainable, do you think, from the Chinese perspective? Yes, I think uh, it is sustainable for the Philippines government to maintain a more balanced foreign policy uh, among his uh, neighbors and also his uh, al al its allies. We know that uh, Mr. Duterte has uh, s publicly stated that uh, it, uh, the Philippines will reduce the size and frequency of joint military exercises with the United States, mm -hmm. while uh, the Philippines will conduct more and more military exercises with Russia and China. And uh, the recent visit by Mr. Duterte uh, to the Chinese uh, ship, I think, uh, can demonstrate his will and determination to take a more independent foreign policy. I think that this uh, foreign policy is natural and also normal. Uh, it should not uh, take a, f a foreign policy like his predecessor, right. which follows the, uh, follow the United States in making provocations against China and uh, has uh, actually uh, provoked tensions in the South China Sea. We can see that now the current policy a foreign policy taken by the Philippines government has uh, brought uh, peace uh, and stability to this region. All and right. also other countries have followed the uh, Philippines in the South China Sea dispute. I see China and the Philippines, as we all know, have had a long history of diplomatic relations that goes back as far as 1975. And recently, of course, we've seen the Filipino president to Turkey certainly visited uh, China uh, this time. Uh, and, and also, uh, Professor Hidarian, some suggest uh, it has a lot to do with the recent uh, warming relations with the Duterte nomics. Some even give it a name, Nam namely building infrastructure, try to promote economic development, and try to be a strong politician, so called a strongman politics, and yet backed by economic development. Is that the uh, President Duterte style as he? waves in into his presidency more this time? Well, I mean, based on my conversation with uh, senior officials in the Duterte administration, my understanding is that they know that the best way for them to win the hearts and minds of the Filipino people and for Duterte to build a long-term legacy is for him to build massive infrastructure across the country like none of his predecessors. The last one in the country who did massive infrastructure projects was the former dictator Marcos and up until now he's very popular and his son almost became the Filipino vice president. So Duterte realizes that his war on drugs, it's something that may help his numbers in the short run to the medium run, but he if he really wants to build a long-term legacy, he has to deal with the infrastructure issue, which previous administrations failed to do. The Aquino administration was very focused on good governance and bringing down corruption. Duterte is very much focused on delivering basic services, mm. and it's very much part of his brand. And this is exactly where China is important, because both China and Japan, uh, from my understanding, will be the major funders and also major sources of technology and engineering skills behind many projects that are, that are being planned across the country, as I said, including in the island of Mindanao now where Duterte comes from and where there has been massive underspending and underinvestment over the past six decades. I so see. that's why China is very important for Duterte and Duterte sees China as a partner for national development. Uh, Mr. Lim though, I mean, turning down a invitation, even though not formally, from President Trump, the President of the United States by Mr. Duterte, is that going to be a smart choice, particularly if he is also facing some internal Disagreement, it seems. Uh, the U.S. has been very proactive in courting uh, the uh, ASEAN leaders, uh, particularly this new administration. So what we have seen is uh, Vice President Mike Pence visiting Indonesia and also praising, praising Indonesia for its democracy and secularism. 
President Trump himself has invited the leaders of uh, Thailand, Singapore and the Philippines uh, to uh, the, the White House. Uh, the other two ASEAN leaders have agreed. Uh, currently, President Duterte hasn't uh, turned it down. What he's saying that he's not sure mm -hmm. currently, according to his schedule, whether he can make it. But we can still possibly see uh, President Duterte confirming uh, the visit later on. So it really depends on uh, his uh, personal schedule and uh, his assessment uh, of uh, his, uh, his needs uh, in terms of uh, national priorities. So uh, what, we, what we can see from this, uh, uh, all this uh, uh, development is a very proactive uh, US uh, foreign policy in courting uh, ASEAN leaders to know ASEAN leaders uh, personally. And this may be a good thing for the region as well uh, because ASEAN uh, leaders and ASEAN itself has to work with the US and China as well. Mm. Uh, Senior Captain Zhang, my final question for you. Even though President Trump has invited all these Southeast Asian leaders, particularly from ASEAN countries, you see he invited him, them on a framework about working on peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. Even though leadership in this region do not have much swaying on that specific issue. So are we going to see the start of a new framework from your perspective of the United States in the Southeast Asia region? Well, I think uh, China uh, welcomes uh, ASEAN's role, uh, a constructive role in, uh, I think, set, uh, settling the Korean Peninsula issue. Uh, we w welcome this. And also, I think the new uh, U.S. policy toward ASEAN is, is also changing. Uh, Mr. Trump's uh, policy toward the South China Sea mm. uh, issue, maybe uh, now it cha changed uh, slightly from what uh, his predecessor uh, has been uh, has been adopted. Right. And also the Philippines has also adopted a new policy toward the United States. I, I don't think the Philippines will follow the United States if the United States continues to make provocations against China in the South China Sea. I see everybody has their bottom line now, of course. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Hidari, and final words from you, uh, 20 seconds you've only got, uh, um, unfortunately. So any thoughts about the new framework about the DPRK nuclear issue rather than the South China Sea dispute? Well, I mean, definitely this is now on the, on the top of the list of Trump. It seems the focus on the South China Sea has declined, and now Trump is very much focused on mobilizing diplomatic support, including from Philippines and China, to deal with the North Korean problem. So the era of strategic patience is over, and now Trump is openly thinking about preventive war. And I think this is something that all of us should be worried about.